Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Retina Roundup. The first interesting article we shall discuss is on the morphological characteristics and vascular changes of retinal arterial macroaneurysms using optical coherence, tomography, and geography. 40 cases of RAM which were diagnosed on FFA were included. 79% of the patients were female. Four different types of vascular morphology were seen on Octa. That was distended, meshed, malformed, and occult types. The round or encircled thrombi were caused by symmetrical or asymmetrical distension. Meshed or dendritic vascular network was likely due to neovascularization caused by ischemia and hypoxia of the arteriolar wall. In the malformed and occult type, the ram was usually regressed and the retinal arterioles were remodeled to distorted. This octa-dependent study would definitely help to further our understanding of retinal arterial macroaneurysms. The second study is a retrospective case series of 25 eyes investigating the fovea protective impact of the double layer sign in eyes with fovea sparing geographic atrophy and age-related macular degeneration. The size of the foveal sparing area was measured on the fundus autofluorescence images at the first and last visits. Each eye was evaluated and divided into two groups according to the presence or absence of DLS inside the foveal sparing area. 65.3% that is 17 eyes were graded as DLS positive within the foveal sparing area. The progression of GA towards the fovea was significantly faster in the DLS negative eyes compared to DLS positive group. DLS is a marker of subclinical macular neovascularization with a high specificity and sensitivity. Therefore, the authors concluded that subfoveal subclinical macular neovascularization could be fovea protective against the central progression of GA and they suggest that one should avoid therapeutic approaches which aim for complete MNB regression in these eyes. Moving on to the next study that describes the clinical features and prognosis of eyes operated for idiopathic epiretinal membranes with different types of intraretinal cystoid spaces in 217 patients. The study classified intraretinal cystoid spaces into either cystoid macular edema and microcystic macular edema or combined type. Cystoid macular edema are multiple cyst-like areas of fluid appearing in the macula causing an increase in the retinal thickness. Microcystic macular edema are cystic lacunar areas of hyporeflectivity with clear boundaries in the inner nuclear layer. They do not cause an increase in macular thickness. 21.5% of the eyes in this study had CME type of edema, while 66.2% had MME type and 12.3% had combined type. Cystoid macular edema were always presented in the earlier stages and had no significant effect on the best corrected visual acuity. Microcystic macular edema was the primary type of edema seen in advanced stages and was associated with a longer duration of symptoms. Both MME type and combined type showed a significantly lower best corrected visual acuity preoperatively and postoperatively. So overall, identifying the type of intraretinal cystoid spaces would help in prognostication of cases. The fourth study compares the outcomes of three different techniques of harvesting the autologous retinal graft for closure of full thickness macular holes post failed surgery. This was a retrospective analysis of 22 eyes. The average preoperative minimum diameter of the macular holes ranged between 650 to 1529 microns. It was harvested using the finesse loop in 5 eyes, retinal punch in 7 eyes, and intraocular scissors in 10 eyes. Macular hole closure was seen in 72.7% .7 of the eyes at 6 weeks. The BCVA at six weeks compared to baseline was statistically significant in the intraocular scissors group and in the finis loop group, but not in the retinal punch group. Good graft integration with the surrounding area was seen in 77.3% of the eyes with no statistical difference amongst the groups. ARG is successful in closing failed large macular holes with or without retinal detachment. 
No significant differences in the anatomic outcomes were noted amongst the three techniques. However, the membrane loop was associated with least number of complications. Now moving on to the last study, polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy has a predilection for hyperopic eyes and it is uncommonly reported in highly myopic eyes. This last study compares the characteristics and treatment response of PCV between highly myopic and non-highly myopic eyes. 116 eyes with PCV, of which 11 were highly myopic, were included. 70% of the patients were women. Subretinal hemorrhage was recorded in only one patient. All the highly myopic eyes showed a thin subfoveal choroid, while three eyes had a pachychoroid phenotype with significant focal choroidal thickening. Visual acuity transiently improved after anti VEGF monotherapy or combination therapy with PDD. The average number of injection was similar between the two groups. The best corrected visual acuity was better in the highly myope group. So overall, this is one of the largest cohorts of PCV in highly myopic eyes reported to date. That's it for now. See you next month.